Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Deakin Edge at Federation Square for this last offering of the Archbishop's Conversations for 2019. Please stay tuned for dates and topics for 2020. We start by acknowledging the original custodians of the land on which we meet, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, and pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging, knowing that the work of reconciliation requires our ongoing commitment. My name is Elizabeth Murray. I am the Assistant Curate at St John's in Turek, and it's my pleasure to be your MC for today's conversation on the topic, the scandal of Victoria's housing crisis. Archbishop Philip Freer is joined today by Lord Mayor Sally Cap, and we don't actually know where Brendan Coates is right now, so our apologies. Sally Cap is our Lord Mayor of the City of Melbourne since being elected in May 2018 and also chairs the major projects and major events portfolios and is the council representative on a number of committees and bodies in Victoria. She began her career as a solicitor after completing law and commerce degrees at the University of Melbourne. Sally has since held a number of senior positions at KPMG and ANZ and has been Victorian Executive Director of the Property Council of Australia. She was also the first woman to hold the post of Agent General for Victoria in the UK, Europe and Israel. Please welcome the Right Honourable Sally Cap. Thank you. Today's conversation moderator is John Cleary. John is a former ABC presenter who worked extensively in both radio and television. As a result of his 30 years with, with the ABC, he's one of the best known commentators on religion including his work with Sunday Nights on ABC Local Radio and The Religion Report on ABC Radio National. John's career began in Perth. He was a member of the original Compass team and co-presenter on the philosophy program Meridian in the 1990s. He continues to be in high demand as a speaker and moderator and it is our pleasure to welcome him here today. Please welcome John Cleary. Good morning. Tomorrow is World Homeless Day. Yes, it's an issue that isn't primarily a local problem, but for us it manifests itself as a local problem. As I travelled here this morning by train, I looked out of the train window over some of the uh, old high-rise apartment towers that went up in the 1950s and 60s as part of uh, major slum clearance programs in some of our old inner city communities. And although those towers have been criticised over the years, I know from personal experience that they were much better than the places they replaced. I had relatives living in some of those inner city slums. And as a child, I remember going through some of those streets and was so amazed at the, at the, at the, the difference those huge towers made. Today we seem to have a similar crisis re-emerging and the questions arise not only what's to be done but what's the cause and who ultimately is responsible. The Lord Mayor of Melbourne, Sally Cap, is one of those who has to pick up this sort of issue not just as a Lord Mayor of a city that's an urban concentration here bounded by the, uh, the conventional boundaries of the city of Melbourne, but of the wider Melbourne metropolitan area, where a city where all roads lead to the MCG. And so the city of Melbourne does seem to attract those who need to find comfort elsewhere. So, Lord Mayor Sally, just what is the dimension that you see confronting you as a mayor of a, a major urban centre and is the problem growing? Well, good morning and thank you for having me as part of this conversation and good morning to all of you who have come through the rain and the cold, a lovely Melbourne morning uh, to be here. And I can see some familiar faces, uh, many of whom are involved in this issue on the streets of Melbourne, so, so thank you for being here. Uh, it's a shame Brendan's not here because he has this incredible amount of data 
uh, about what's happening in housing. And I recommend you have a look at the Grattan report on housing affordability because it's got some great information as well as some uh, good solutions. Uh, but what I get concerned about as the Lord Mayor of Melbourne is that uh, we produce a lot of reports and we have lots of data, whether it's the ABS data, uh, experts looking at what's happening with housing, and two things are happening. One, the scale of this issue seems to grow. And when the scale of issues grow, a lot of people then feel disempowered, feel that it's too difficult to uh, meet that challenge, and we tend to get a disengagement. I'm just talking about the community generally. And there's no doubt that the current ABS data that's used by the federal government is that almost 120,000 people across Australia are homeless every night. 120,000 people. And that does almost seem insurmountable. But we need to make sure that this challenge uh, is uh, understood uh, in uh, a frame that we can all say we can do something about this. And that's certainly part of the uh, efforts at the town hall at the moment. The other thing that I find, and this is where I wanted to really finish this piece, the other thing I find with a lot of those discussions is that we dehumanise this issue. And I know from the meetings that I've been having in Canberra, very well-intentioned meetings, that we are so far away from the issue and we are looking at lots of data and we are forgetting that this is about our fellow human beings and the experiences that they are having every day. And what I've learnt over the last 17 months as Lord Mayor is that we cannot make any assumptions about the people who are rough sleeping or who are part of the majority that we don't even see that are sleeping in cars or they're in squats or they're in rooming houses or they're in overcrowded accommodation. Uh, we, we can't make any assumptions about those people but because, as I say, but that, that all by the grace of God go I, there are just these circumstances that happen in people's lives that put them on this slippery slope down into homelessness. And really, it could be any one of us. And it's about being a caring community. It's about valuing every individual. It's about respecting uh, what they need in their lives. And I really believe that it is something that we can manage. There are things that we can do to make sure that we can help everybody in their individual circumstances and help them on that pathway out of homelessness. And whilst I love the data too, I'm a lawyer by trade, so I love all of that sort of stuff, if we dehumanise this issue, we really will lose the opportunity to make a big difference because every single one of us can make a difference every day. Archbishop Philip, the... Um the church stands here in a, in a major spot in the middle of the city. The role of the church's moral leadership in the, in the civic culture is a historic one. And homelessness is one of those issues which has been a perennial. If you go back over the history of, of this city, that's been something that the church has had to speak on over the years. What particularly impels you to say this is an issue we've got to talk, to, talk about now? Well, I think both speak and act, John. Um, you can take it back to whatever period of time, but one of my predecessors, uh, Joseph Booth, who was Archbishop in the 50s, was uh, very concerned about uh, people he saw as uh, returned servicemen, often from the First World War, who were then approaching advanced age in the 1950s and, and were probably still suffering the effects of trauma. He started up a... Uh, uh, a process of some aged care which now has matured into um, an aged care provider called Benitas. And uh, I think at different times, uh, Father Gerard Tucker, very involved, he talked about the slum clearance uh, with the Brother of St. Lawrence and uh, circumstances in, in Fitzroy that he was saw passionately and there was a great movie he made in the 1950s just showing the circumstances of children growing up in some of the, the slums of Fitzroy. And, and out of that, the Brother of St. Lawrence has developed a real uh, practice of uh, looking at um, what are the structural issues. And I think through that, we've, we've learnt that there are life transitions that make people particularly vulnerable. So, uh, you know, moving into adulthood is a vulnerable time for people in finding uh, housing security. And so we've we run a, a, a program 
uh, with the Kangan TAFE at Broad Meadows, which is called a youth foyer. So we have young people there who either are homeless or at risk of homelessness, who are living in a residential um, accommodation on the, the campus of that TAFE college, uh, do some educational programs there. And the, uh, the transition after the 18 months, two years of people are involved in that into security of housing is fantastic. It's a, it's a wonderful success rate, which um, suggests to me that there are interventions we can do because people have got an aspiration to make their circumstances more fulfilling and purposeful. And often we need to put some apparatus uh, around their circumstances at these times of vulnerability. I think times of um, relationship breakdown, uh, separation, divorce, certainly times of retirement, these are very vulnerable times for people who can move from, from living um, a life where they can participate in the, in the, say, the rental market to then, uh, if they, uh, you know, circumstances change, they have very uh, limited retirement benefits, then the whole question, but the, the circumstances are then all changed entirely. So, uh, but I think that it's, I just sort of make the point that there's times of vulnerability and there are also, I think, constructive interventions that we, we can make as a society. And I hope we'll have a chance to unfold a little bit of that and look at some of the the structural issues that people are often caught in in these circumstances. Yeah, it, it does seem that there really are two layers to this problem. One, as, as you've indicated, people's personal circumstances place them in situations which are impossible for them. But at another level, we also seem to have a continuing debate. At, at, at the moment, it's fairly low level in, in this country about whether or not there are structural issues involved, about the way the economy is being managed particularly with regard to provision of infrastructure, if you like, the current buzzword. Um, but first, let's talk about some of those issues that confront people day to day. Mm. As Lord Mayor, for example, one often hears the, the line, oh, big city authorities, homelessness is increasing in those big cities, but the response of city authorities is just to criminalise the homeless and sweep them off the streets and hide them. And we got that debate around the Olympic Games, for example, if people can remember back then. But that issue still occurs. Now, how do you respond? Because you must have heard that so many times. Mm. And it's, it's very relevant to now because uh, following the uh, camp, if you like, uh, that happened around Flinders Street Station a couple of years ago uh, at the time of the Australian Open, the city really did start to go down more of the line of criminal, criminalisation and looking at compliance uh, and regulatory responses. I just don't think that's the right thing to do. And uh, all of the studies, in fact, uh, this year there have been quite a lot of studies out to show that just by uh, criminalising, increasing fines, moving people on, actually entrenches homelessness. It becomes more and more difficult for people to find their way out of the situation uh, that they're in. We have lots of examples where you know, we might need to give uh, fines to people who consistently beg or who uh, undertake antisocial behaviour or there are fines for people that are, in, uh, that are living in cars but they're parked in the wrong spots. Those fines actually only add to the burden. They don't help really in any way of uh, um, assisting that person or those people uh, out of their situation. I'm really pleased to say that we decided to take a different approach uh, at the City of Melbourne about 12 months ago, and that was very much relying on the relationships we have, and I can see Vic Pohl, Craig Peel here this morning, and also Brendan Nottle from the Salvation Army. We work very closely with both of those organisations to say that there's got to be a better way that we can manage. The compliance regulation levers uh, are, are one set of responses. What are the more effective responses? And as I alluded to earlier, it was very much about being a caring city. So how do we get to know those individuals who are sleeping on our streets? How do we understand those complex circumstances that brought them to this most vulnerable point in their lives? And how do we work with them as individuals to help them on that pathway out of homelessness? So by changing our approach, we've completely really changed the way that we go about dealing with these issues. It's meant some really important things. Firstly, it's meant 
better coordination across agencies. Uh, and that's why I wanted to, to call out Craig and Brendan because our teams are now working very closely together every day to share information, to pull resources, to coordinate a response uh, for people who are on our streets. And I think that coordination has only been able to come because we've opened up our organisation to a different response. And it also means that we can work together uh, to, uh, to build solutions, uh, which is what we're working on at the moment. I think for city authorities, it's very difficult because most of the circumstances that bring people to this point are as a result of policies or policy failures that happen at a federal and a state government level. But instead of continuing to push the issue up to another level of government, as a city and other municipal governments are joining us in this, we're saying there are things that we can do, and so we're focusing our efforts on that, including the provision of more crisis accommodation in our city. But as you have said, why do people end up on our streets? I think we really have to address these issues. Uh, and as the Archbishop uh, um, very eloquently pointed out. What we see on the spectrum is that it, people need help at those times of vulnerability. It could be just short-term financial assistance to help with rent or a mortgage payment, all the way through to very, very uh, complex mental health or substance abuse issues. There are people experiencing uh, circumstances right across that spectrum. So how do we actually look at how do we let people fall through the cracks? How is it that Centrelink and New Start and those federal government support services are failing people? How is it that we, for I would say four decades at least, how have we underinvested in housing here in Victoria, resulting in people needing to choose alternates? How is that? And I actually feel all of us have a responsibility in that because politicians very much respond to issues they think will get them voted in. And we've let that caring, uh, that, that sense of uh, wanting to create that safety net, that uh, priority of housing completely fall down the to-do list. And as a result, uh, we've had governments that just have let the investment in core, the word is infrastructure, or core housing, fall away. We have uh, allowed our governments to uh, reduce the funding that goes into things like Centrelink. Uh, and those housing plus support services are the two elements that absolutely have to be there when people are at their most vulnerable. How do we expect people to get a job if they don't have a safe, secure place to sleep every night? To me, it's ridiculous, but you can't get your Centrelink payment unless you show that you're going for jobs, but meanwhile you're struggling to actually feel safe every day. I remember meeting a gentleman up at the Salvos one night uh, who introduced himself as Arthur, and he described himself as a non-person. And it's absolutely heartbreaking that there are people who believe that within the Australian context, the Victorian, the Melbourne, the city of Melbourne context, they have ceased to exist as people that we value because he couldn't fill out the Centrelink forms due to mental health issues. He lost touch with his family and there were no support services uh, available to help him back into his life. And because he couldn't do the Centrelink papers and there weren't people there mm. to help him, he ceased to exist. So even when you present for, for health, uh, health services, you, there are no records of you. And it's the generosity then of those health providers to actually help you. Luckily, he is now uh, back on track with the help uh, of uh, the Salvos and others around town. But, but how does this happen in a country that is as prosperous and really we consider ourselves to be a very caring community? Nonetheless, the number of these people are actually increasing. And look, I just wanted to touch on a couple of other things uh, because Brendan's not here, but you know, we do, we have seen a structural shift. There's no doubt that the Australian dream of owning a, a home with a white picket fence on a quarter acre block has changed significantly. Uh, the majority of us, or very soon the majority of us will be renters. And uh, we, we have had a stigma around rental, but that hopefully is changing. 
The problem is we still don't even have enough rental mm. properties available. So the most stressed cohort of people within the city of Melbourne, and I know this exists right across inner Melbourne, are renters. I might and come back to that issue mm. in, in a, a couple of moments. But Archbishop, for the best part of a century, if we go back to when Melbourne was founded or even before that, 50 years before that, when, when Cindy was founded, the Anglican Church had primary responsibility for the welfare of citizens. Um, and it was in the 20th century, from perhaps the experience of the Great Depression onwards, that governments began to move into this space. But up until that time, and right up until the 1950s, churches and charities were providing much of the housing for itinerants and homeless. There were big shelters mm -hmm. for people. Churches moved out of those as governments moved into the area. Over the last 30 years, we've seen governments move out of the area, yet the churches and charities, well, <laughs> have, have faced the issue as best they can, but not in quite the same way as when they were central to the welfare of the city. What are the levers that you have available to you these days? Well, I think the, the, the hinging point in, in the narrative you're saying was really the Second World War and uh, the agreement in Britain and Australia that the war had to be, uh, there had to be a purpose out of it and it had to be a different society. And so you had in both countries departments of post-war reconstruction and they really crystallised it was a responsibility of the whole of society to make a livable society for everyone. So you, you start having written into the chart of the Reserve Bank of Australia about um, uh, uh, you know, for adult male employment, concepts which are about participation in society which hadn't been there before. So structurally, we've really moved uh, since the Second World War to an, an increasing embracing of that responsibility by the whole of society and um, uh, I was just giving a, a talk uh, a short while back where uh, one of the leaders of the Brothers of St Lawrence at the time of the 1960s was saying, well, this is to be welcome. This is what a society should do and, the, and churches should, uh, they should be glad that government's stepping up to take that responsibility. They should be then looking for the new areas of uh, an absence to provoke the conscience of the nation. Mm -hmm. So I, th I think we've got, we've got a situation at the moment where our, our consciences are a bit dulled and I think the, the fact that we've become used to uh, a visible and fairly desperate representation of um, this whole question of housing security in the form of homelessness in most cities, towns of our country means that our, I think our moral consciences are, are, are a bit dulled compared to what they might have been. You know, I think if you wiggle it back to the 50s and 60s, the idea that people would be, uh, you know, in a way, living on the street would have been shocking to people. It would have been an outrage. There, you know, people said, "This can't happen. This is not the kind of society we are." So we've become, in a sense, a bit dull to that. It doesn't seem to be an imperative. Um, I don't think we, we we haven't gone into the deserving and undeserving poor kind of line. But there's, you know, there's always kind of dog whistling and nuances around, you know, whether it was, you know, Joe Hockey's lifters and leaners or whatever kind of metaphors you use, there, there is a, a kind of a sense suggested, not really explicitly said, that, mm. well, you know, it's, it's kind of some people prosper because of um, their good efforts and advantages, other people don't because of, you know, perhaps some moral failings. Now, I, I think that that all dulls the sense of our... Commonly called corporate... dull bludgers. Well, it, it, it can happen in many ways. There's lots, <laughs> lots of language and lots of dog whistling, but you've got to get the picture. But I think that dulls our sense of a corporate responsibility. Mm. I think at the last federal election, we actually had you know, it, you know, the beginning of some discussion about reform, about the whole question of uh, negative gearing and uh, Labor's policy was for that to only be applied to new housing construction rather than existing houses, it was a fairly modest change, but you know, I think that those kind of policy discussions following the last federal election are probably off the agenda for as long as you want to say now, because I think that big picture uh, policy discussion, clearly uh, it, it, it will be taken by federal politicians at least to be unpalatable to the Australian public. So I think we, we have these enduring structural issues um, I think the churches, through their through their agencies, and you've heard some of the work in other other churches like the Salvation Army and and others, uh, they are able to do 
some things, but probably uh, only with the support of, of government. And so some of our, our best work is pushing for systemic change. Anglicare uh, annually look at rental affordability, and I think they demonstrate pretty much year on year, it's depressing really, in most of our capital cities, if you are on benefits, uh, like Centrelink benefits, or if you're on Newstart or Youth Allowance, uh, actual, you know, the, there is, isn't any affordable rental accommodation unless you start spending 80% of your income on, on accommodation, which becomes impossible. So, you know, we, we well know there are, are structural situations. So I think we've got to push towards, push towards what are the systemic issues that, that we need to address. And, uh, you know, we, we know from, I think, the, the work that Tony Nicholson did with, uh, in the whole of Victoria looking at uh, homelessness and people who are sleeping out rough is that um, around half of the people are on New Start or Youth Allowance. They are meant to be job ready. Uh, and with the support they get from those federal government programs, um, they really can't afford to um, be in secure accommodation. And then how can they be job ready? So this, this is this kind of crazy situation we're in. And I think we've all become quite morally dull about that. We're not outraged about that. And sadly, we're living in a world where you need, it seems, to turn up the volume very high uh, to be heard. Well, in that arena, what levers are open to you um, you have a good relationship with the city, but the levers open to you from the financial resources of the church, from ad access to government, state and federal. Are you able to sort of exercise any influence at all? Do you find the things that you are saying are being heard and listened to? Well, we have, we have um, in different times partnered with initiatives. Uh, we, we have on uh, various parish land parcels um, partnerships with the uh, State Housing Department that go back now probably 20 years for people to have um, low cost accommodation. Uh, there are some creative ideas we're looking at now, even with some um, private investors, people who come from um, pension funds. Uh, of some quite creative solutions to um, uh, prioritise some housing for people who are financially disadvantaged, but to allow them to gain some benefit out of the, the uplift of the value of that. So they, uh, when their circumstances change, they get into employment, they can leave that housing, but also with some dividend of the up kick of the, of the value of the housing. So I think there are some innovative things, but, you know, we're uh, in, in, the, in the scale of things, we are... Um, we are not a big influence in, the, in being able to deliver the amelioration of that. Uh, and I think that it, it, we are pushed more and more into this being a, a structural issue for the whole of society. You know, where, so when we say get Fisherman's Bend, uh, the quarter of a million people live there, or at Egate, you know, what will be the provision that will be required there for uh, low cost housing, for public housing? The, the, these are the, the structural principles that, that really will sit with other levels than with community organisations like us. We want to be advocates, but I think you know, that's where we can put pressure on state governments to say, well, you've, you've got opportunities of creative solutions. S Sally, you've I'm already mentioned... I'm squirming on my seat. That, well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you've already mentioned the, some of the things that the council is, is able to do, but you are also faced with financial constraints. And we know whenever the question is kicked upstairs, particularly on an issue like this, a federal politician can say, well, that's really a state issue. And the state government can say, well, look, that homelessness in the inner city there, that's really council bylaw stuff. So it's an, an issue which nobody has to own, really, in, in, the, in the current political environment. Well, I, I think that's it. You know, we, we all need to own this and we all need to agree that there's something that, that each of us needs to do because we are now at that point where there is such chronic failure across our system that it's going to take an effort at every level of government and across every sector, from private citizen to uh, big corporations as well. So just to give you an idea, from our perspective, uh, and it's World Homelessness Day tomorrow, as you said, we have a summit here in Melbourne of the capital city, Lord Mayors, together with a whole lot of uh, specialists uh, around this issue. 
uh, to keep the momentum going in terms of advocacy on this issue. At a federal government level, billions of dollars are spent on this issue every year, and yet the problem's getting worse. So is that money being spent well, and what are the structural changes that we need from tax policy settings all the way through to the way that we resource Centrelink? So what are the conversations going on there? And we're certainly engaging with all of the relevant ministers. How are we promoting uh, the building of more homes uh, in Australia? Because it is about housing first and with support services. So how can the federal government play a role in that? The state government is absolutely at the centre of this. And again, they will say, we are spending billions of dollars on this issue. And we need to say, then why is it getting worse? And we need to have the opportunity to examine where that funding is going, where it's not being effective, how can we redirect uh, those funds into services that really do make a difference? And again, the biggest conundrum here is how do we get more public uh, social and community housing, because unfortunately, uh, in that spectrum of people facing homelessness, the biggest rump of the issue is the access to uh, supported or subsidised housing of some sort. Public housing, social housing, community housing, and we need to put a big effort into that. Uh, we estimate just in the city of Melbourne, we need 5,000 more of those homes every year for the next 10 years at least. The state government in their commitment to federal government under the National Housing and Homelessness Agreement committed to 1,000 across Victoria. And in this year's budget, there's funding for 250. 250. We are never going to get there if we don't put a big effort into this housing. And we all have a role to play. So state government really does have that big responsibility for public, social, and then supporting community housing. But we have a role to play at local government level. What are we doing to make sure that we facilitate uh, the building of more homes and appropriate housing as well? Housing that's respectful and understands that these are individuals and they want to live lives just like us, so not uh, inadequate housing. And uh, one of our biggest challenges is one, playing with the planning scheme, which has quite a lot of restrictions. So we're asking for reform, particularly around transport hubs, uh, to be able to increase density uh, we are doing that on a project-by-project project basis across the city. But then one of the biggest hurdles we face is the backlash from our community about increase to density. Not in my backyard. That's why I'm looking at everybody here. <laughs> we all have a role to play in moving our NIMBYs to YIMBYs. Yes, in my backyard. Because actually, when did we become so selfish? I know that you were using much nicer words earlier. Uh, that we've, um, we've dulled our sense of mm. humanity. But it's, it's actually about how selfish we are as individuals. We need to be able to share more. And unfortunately, that is taking quite a long time in terms of adjustment of community uh, expectations and attitudes because when we have more recently uh, considered applications for projects where affordable housing is included, which we're looking for. So a project in North Melbourne included 20% affordable homes, uh, which means that rental or uh, sale prices would be 30% lower than market, which hmm. is what the uh, agreed benchmark is. We had 63 objections to that project from people around it. Because to make that project work, we were considering giving two extra levels of height. Mm. We've got to find ways to share. We've got to find ways that we can compromise. And we absolutely understand that we don't want to see high density on every street in our neighbourhoods across Melbourne. But we do need to agree places where we can uh, have higher density. Normally they're around transport nodes because that's a great way of making sure that are, they're affordable places to live, good access to services, etc. Uh, but at the moment we are still struggling to be able to bring uh, community support along with uh, increasing density and 
allowing the sorts of projects where we can welcome uh, people who are struggling uh, at different phases of their life into our communities. I just look at Osnum House, uh, completely redone, absolutely fantastic, and almost didn't happen as a result of objections from people in the neighbourhood. I, I understand this is a sensitive issue, but we do need to have this debate in our community. If we're going to have a bottom-up, I call it, approach to change here, that is one of the most significant changes that we can make, a different attitudes to density in our neighbourhoods so that we can build uh, more homes. And can I just finish on one thing? When people present for homeless services uh, within Melbourne, 40% of those people present needing some sort of financial assistance. And often it's just interim or temporary. And that they're, they're uh, some of the easier cases to deal with. The next 30% at the moment are domestic violence uh, victims. They need a lot of help. They need new homes. They need support services. They need safety in many cases. Uh, they have to be relocated, they need support integrating into new communities, schools, etc. 30% of the cohort and uh, the majority of those are older women. Then we start to get into cases where there are more extreme mental health issues, people coming out of institutions like jails or mental health institutions who can't find accommodation and are not supported in our communities uh, and substance abuse, etc. And you can imagine what the stats show. As soon as you start that slide down into homelessness, even if it starts with financial hardship, the mental health issues and then reliance on substance that becomes an addiction just becomes this horrible snowball effect. And if we can start to uh, step in at those very critical points in people's lives to provide a home, a safe home with some support services, in the long run, it will save us all a lot of money as taxpayers and we will have a much happier, healthier uh, and caring community to live in. Archbishop, you mentioned the work of groups like the Brotherhood of St Lawrence over the years, and they've, been, um, they've, they've kept two prongs going. They've had uh, active programs, but they've also done a lot of research. One of the interesting things emerging out of recent research is that the current problems, if not addressed, won't just increase, they'll accelerate. And one of the issues that's been pointed to is the problems of intergenerational problems, where if we're going into a generation of renters, what do those ageing renters have to pass on to their children? They haven't got a, a house to pass on any longer. What do they do if they're super, they haven't got the superannuation to pass on? So you're looking at, at two profiles being in trouble. Younger people, because they don't have the money to afford to get into the market, and older people who no longer can sell the house to invest in their retirement. So we're accelerating at two levels, and both of these groups of people are not people who would be considered traditionally as candidates for the homeless on the streets. Well, I think that we, um, we could learn a lot from mothers' uh, overseas experience, because in some countries it's quite normative to be a renter. And uh, the rental laws uh, give uh, more protection to people who are renters, whereas our, our laws in Australia, they really put more the, um, uh, the power with the, the landlord. And it, it, structurally, it just means people have quite uh, insecure possibilities there. They can't actually make a, a confident plan uh, to be a renter, which is, you know, because we, we, otherwise we get into this sort of hierarchy that, you know, it's sort of it's uh, you're morally best if you can be a, a landowner. You can kind of, you know, so it's almost as good being a renter is a bit lower down. It's, we, end up, we end up with something which is a, quite distorted because the issue is for people to have, I think, um, housing, security, however uh, it, it's achieved. So I think we, um, we've got to un unpack some of that a bit, but I think that we, we could... E it's about priorities, really. We've got... Um, for instance, it's, uh, it's important that we do infrastructure development. It's important we remove level crossings, and uh, it's important we build more roads and all those kinds of things. Melbourne, Greater Melbourne's got 100,000 people a year coming to it annually. All of those, uh, all of that new development 
puts pressure on infrastructure. But, but there's still there's priorities as to what's spent. We had you know, vast windfalls when, they say, the Port of Melbourne was sold, uh, which has allowed significant uh, expenditure on state infrastructure. But it's a matter of a, a priority as to the timing of things, what's done and how it's done. And I think that the fact that uh, we, we aren't prioritising the construction of the number of uh, affordable house, houses that uh, Sally's mentioned, uh, that where you know it, it sort of sits a bit forgotten because as uh, electors we're probably more sensitive to the things that feed into our daily comfort, our commuting comfort, our uh, you know in a city that's almost gone mad with cars, we, we we'd like to be able to drive more easily, put more lanes on freeways and all the rest of it. So it's about priorities, and ultimately I think that you know, politicians, uh, they, they reflect back effectively the values that we have. Well, all roads seem to be leading back to ultimately a source here because state, oh well, local councils are limited with the budget. State governments are in themselves limited by their budgets. Federal governments are the source of taxation revenue. We have a national taxation structure. So federal housing policy seems to be an area that, yes, it's acknowledged, but it's an area that federal politicians can duck and weave because it's the easiest one in which to say on a state responsibility or local government responsibility. What focus then is, is being pushed onto the federal government and saying, look, you're in an area where, where these days, yes, we want to keep the, the budget stable, the Reserve Bank may differ in, in the way that's achieved, saying that, no, we need to invest in infrastructure. Is there an opportunity here to say to the federal government, look, you have a building crisis in homelessness, you have a, a budget where they're saying, if you want to get the economy moving, invest in infrastructure, social housing is an area that would benefit all in this. Yet, then... Is it non-economic but more ideological factors that move in? Governments are saying, no, 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 we don't want to get back into this area. Good, and I can see Brendan's just arrived, so while he gets his breath... <laughs> Absolutely, and this is the time. This is one of the reasons why I wanted to be part of this conversation this morning and why we're so proactive on this topic, uh, because we are starting to see some movement here. There is a national housing and homelessness agreement that I knew nothing about that sets the framework between the federal government and the state government on funding housing and homelessness in Australia. We're calling for that to be renegotiated and for local government to become part of that so that that each level of government understands its role, uh, responsibilities, and there are accountabilities at each of those levels. We campaigned as Council of Capital City Lord Mayors, together with a number of other groups, before the last election for there to be a homelessness minister. We now have a homelessness minister, Luke Howarth. We, uh, as I said, campaigning at the moment for the resetting of the National Housing and Homelessness Agreement so that we can feel confident that the money allocated there is being spent to actually create the outcomes that we need because we're not seeing that at the moment. Uh, we're also seeing a shift in dialogue. We are saying housing should be considered like every other form of economic infrastructure. We tend to love economic infrastructure, as the Archbishop says, partly because it goes to our own experience, but also because when we look at economic infrastructure, we can have a definitive return on investment. We can calculate a benefit to the community. It's a, a vernacular that we all understand and that we've backed for mm. a long time. If we could put housing into economic infrastructure, Structure and look at the uh, benefit and the return on investment. And we actually calculated that by looking at the money we wouldn't have to spend on so many services if we actually had an intervention early, uh, in earlier in this journey and we were able to uh, take people out of homelessness. That return on investment would absolutely position housing projects at the top of the economic infrastructure pile. And we're starting to see that dialogue change at the moment because Infrastructure Australia for the first time uh, in their recent report included housing and Infrastructure Victoria since it uh, was set up about five years ago now has always included housing as an important form of economic infrastructure. So we are starting to see 
the conversation change. We're starting to see a shift uh, and we are starting to, uh, um, I, I hope, see some sort of positive momentum towards federal government coordinating better uh, across policy and working with state and local governments to see some change here. But we need a chorus of voices uh, to keep encouraging and pushing uh, our federal governments uh, towards uh, that. And just as, as an example of policy settings and as a lead into Brendan, uh, we uh, had the big debate about negative gearing in the last election, and I don't think people really understand the importance of that uh, policy setting. Because unlike so many other countries around the world where renting is a natural thing, uh, in many of those countries, uh, rental accommodation is owned by one institution or one organisation. We have this phenomenon here in Australia that this negative gearing uh, benefit has uh, proliferated, which is that the, our landlords are all mums and dads which is terrific in one perspective, but what it means is that that tenure, that security, mm. is completely at the whim of an owner. Their children want to come in. They need to sell it because they've got a tax mm. bill. Uh, they don't have enough money to fix the uh, maintenance issues on the property. Mm. It all comes down to an individual decision. Whereas an, a big asset class like Build to Rent that exists in most other developed nations around the world and works brilliantly to provide security of tenure and good uh, rental accommodation doesn't exist in Australia, but it could if the federal government changed some of those policy settings and that would introduce uh, a huge amount of relief across uh, our rental cohort. So it's those sorts of things that really can make a change. But I feel that without the chorus of Australians calling for this, it's going to be difficult to get the fundamental shift that we need. Brendan, welcome. You've just arrived at the right time because we'd, we'd moved into a discussion about what can be done. Yes. And uh, to what extent the different levels of government, state, local and federal, uh, are involved and ultimately the source of the federal government is our, ta our tax stream. Um, the Grattan Institute's been doing a lot of work on this. You can perhaps outline some of those initiatives that you're suggesting could be available to governments at the federal level. And so, perhaps you may want to make some comment about the general dimension of the issue too. Well, good morning everyone and apologies for being late. A bit of a calendar mishap on my behalf, which I'll put down to having a six month old at home, but I don't think that's <laughs> probably a fair excuse no, for most people. No, that's a good people. one, that's a good one. <laughs> Uh, well, look, I think as the conversation's probably gone to today, there are big problems with housing. So housing is unaffordable for many Australians, and it's unaffordable particularly for those at the bottom. And that is manifesting itself in all sorts of ways. Lots of people in rental stress, uh, are rising rates of homelessness in our major cities, particularly in Sydney, um, which is, I think, incidentally, where housing is most expensive. Mm. So if we think about what the problems are, well, housing's too expensive, and we can fix that through planning systems and the like. Um, a lot of households can't afford housing, and that's largely a problem to do with income, as in they, they do not have the income available to fund the life that they need to live after paying for their housing costs. So what most So you're talking about people who are in jobs who traditionally would have been able to aspire to a house are now basically out of the market given the way the, the yeah. property market has moved ahead of the, the wages and salaries. Absolutely. So there's a problem of uh, falling home ownership, which I think is uh, challenging the uh, traditional notions of what the great Australian dream, dream oh. is, Australian way of life. So home ownership is falling very fast amongst younger, poor Australians. Uh, and then there is a problem for those who are in the rental market. And the, there was some work done by the Productivity Commission recently that showed that the difference is not necessarily um, the rates of rental stress in the rental market haven't increased that much. It's just there's so many more households renting in the past and renting with young families. Families. And I think to the comments that Sally was just making, the challenge here is the rental market has historically been seen as something that you transition through on the way to home ownership. And now we're in a world where Australians are going to be staying in the rental market for 10, 20, 30 years. On our numbers, you know, we may see something like between a third and half of Australians retiring without owning their own home in 40 years' time. And so some of those challenges are in the rental market in trying to make that more secure. So Sally talked about uh, build to rent, um, about negative gearing. That's certainly part of the story. Another part of it is land tax. So it's basically uneconomic for a large institutional investor to own large amounts of housing in Australia. So I can't find a single super fund that owns market rent housing, so rents that, housing that's rented out at market rates. 
essentially because we're taxing land um, on a progressive scale, so you, you tax at a high rate the more land that you own, but it's on the total land holding. And so essentially, if you're a large institutional investor, you pretty much lose something like a quarter of the return if, you're in, if you hold you know, 100, 200 dwellings. And so what we have are mum and dad investors and they're not great at delivering security of tenure. Is, is the legislative framework there federal or state? That's a state issue. Yeah. So we developed these progressive land taxes in Australia on total land holdings in the late 19th century. It was a way of basically breaking up the squadocracy in the western districts of Victoria. It was wildly <laughs> successful. But it's generated new problems today, which is that we can't get those kind of large institutional landlords into the market. And unless you fix that problem, you probably won't see build to rent take off in Australia. Right, right. So what do you suggest, because we are going to be tight for time, given the federal government ultimately is a source of strategic national policy and funding direction, what initiatives would be available at that level to encourage state and local governments to facilitate their capacity? So the, what the Commonwealth should do itself is the Commonwealth runs the income support system. It also has access to the more top popular tax bases in Australia. Um, you know, no one likes taxes, but we tend to don't mind income tax as much as we don't like land tax or stamp duty. And so what the Commonwealth can do is it's got to boost rent assistance. It's the number one thing it should do. So this is the payment that's provided to those on income support, uh, whether it's the pension, disability support pension, unemployment benefits, so new start. Um, that rate has grown in line with inflation for the last 20 years when rents have been growing faster than that. And the net effect of that has been that the real value's fallen, and that's one of the reasons why people are really struggling. So boosting that by 40% and then indexing it going forward to the rents paid by low-income earners should be the number one priority for the Feds. Uh, that would cost $1.2 billion a year. It's not a small amount of money, uh, particularly um, at a time when the government is still aiming for a budget surplus. And beyond that, the Commonwealth's lever is, frankly, that it has hold of the purse strings, much more so than the states do. And so if it's going to put more money into housing beyond that, it should be built funding the provision of social housing. We did this during the global financial crisis. So there was an initiative called the Social Housing Initiative where the federal government built 20,000 social housing units as stimulus. Um, and it was wildly successful. You know, mm. we built these units within about 12 to 18 months. Um, they largely went to those that otherwise would have been homeless. Um, and it was a big economic stimulus to the economy at a point when the construction sector was slowing down, which is kind of the world that we see ourselves in today, increasingly. So construction is slowing in Melbourne and Sydney. And this sort of stimulus would be very effective in providing support to employment and meeting an important social need. And just on that, sorry, if I can say, for every one job on an infrastructure project, it's worth about three jobs, or equivalent to three jobs on a construction project. So our obsession with infrastructure, and I love you know, new train lines and those sorts of things as well. If we can put more funding into construction, we'll actually see more stimulus. And it's a lot faster, so it's very hard to build a train line under the Yarra, mm. to build a tunnel. It's actually not that hard to put up a six-storey apartment building. We can do that pretty quickly. Mm. And so that's what we've done in the past and probably what we should do today. And just finally, if we don't do that, if we don't address this problem and starting now, what are we looking at in terms of the demography of Australia in the next 15 to 20 years? Well, if we don't deal with the broader housing problems, then we're increasingly going to see a world where people don't own their own home. It'll become too expensive. It's already becoming too expensive in Melbourne and Sydney. And that spills down through the economic layers. So it means more people are renting. Um, and then because housing costs are higher than they otherwise probably should be, then those at the bottom will be under increasing pressure to be able to you know, keep a roof over their heads and food on the table. So homelessness increases? Essentially, we end up with a rising world, a growing gap between the, the, the housing haves and the have-nots. That will lead to an increase in inequality. So we've certainly seen that in our work. Income inequality in Australia hasn't changed very much, but income inequality, once you account for housing costs, has actually changed quite a lot because lower-income Australians are spending much more on housing than the past. And as you said, homelessness will increase. And that's you know, a, a situation that when people find themselves homeless, it's an incredibly terrible position to be in. Their life expectancy is 20 years lower than the average Australian. Um, and that's something I think is morally, as a society, that we want to try to avoid. Archbishop, any uh, comment on that as a, as a lesson to the federal government? Mm. From oh, what would the church be asking? I think that's a good summary, um, because I think, and I think it is, it is about how we, uh, we perceive our influence. I think that we can be a bit passive in this, and um, you know, in a world of competing things that we might think are urgent, 
this doesn't, hasn't grasped much public attention, which is why it's, this discussion is useful this morning. You know, I think we've seen uh, people who are wanting to take to the streets about matters that they feel are uh, urgent matters of um, political reform, but this doesn't seem to be on the spectrum of things that people are getting animated about, and I think we're suggesting it's, uh, it is uh, important in terms of policy, but it's also important in terms of who, who we are as members of society and, and, and how, what it means about us if we tolerate um, a society that just drifts into uh, increasing disparity and inequality in this way. Well, thanks to our panellists. I think it's now time we, uh, we took a few questions. Yes, uh, good morning, and thank you for your address by the panel. Um, just two years ago, I sat in the same venue, and uh, at that, the panel consisted of Tony Nicholson from Brotherhood St. Lawrence, and uh, uh, Jason Russell, who was an advocate for homelessness. And at that time, it was hoped that the government, state government would introduce a, uh, some policies that would show, assist in this regard. Two years on, the fact we are sitting here means it hasn't changed. It's gone, in fact, you might say it's gone backwards. My po the point I'm making here is that we can walk out of the portals of St Paul's Cathedral into Swanson Street, and I'm ashamed and appalled to see what is taking place as far as some of the people who are in the streets there. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. I work in the western suburbs of Melbourne, and I can see people there who come to see us who are living in cars and so on. Now, I think... The point has been made, perhaps, that the church could take a greater role if they would pool resources with all the church organisations to, to combat this. I think they, should, in my opinion, should take a more proactive role rather than a reactive role and, and, and assist the, um, pushing this subject so it comes to the forefront. Thank you. Thank you. And down the front here. I'm uh, Geneve Blackwell, Assistant Bishop in the Diocese, and I'm responsible for the Preventing Violence Against Women program. Thank you for highlighting the particular experience of women with homelessness that's often hidden. I was wondering if you had more to say, and it might be Brendan as well from the Grattan Institute, uh, but I was wondering, Lord Mayor, if you had more to say in terms of um, policies and insights into attitudes that can have a, an impact on helping to uh, prevent or respond more helpfully to the situation of violence, uh, of the homelessness that women can find themselves in and their families. Oh, in terms of proactivity, um, as I mentioned earlier, we, we have in an earlier state government partnership at a number of sites, uh, probably um, rising about a, a hundred um, uh, accommodation units. Now they're all, uh, you know, low. They're all low, gr ground level. You know, what you could have might imagine 20 years ago was seemed a good solution at places like Oakley and Ringwood. It'd be imaginable now we could actually build high rise there. You've got all the the planning issues, but you know there are uh, th there are things that could happen because there's no, in a way, principled reason. And just pick those places because they're they're clear in my mind. At say Oakley and Ringwood, we're probably together. We've got about um, 70 people who are financially disadvantaged living in, uh, you know, a, a sort of a, a housing community. There is no reason why that couldn't easily become 700 or 800 with uh, the development of high-rise and a, a renewal of that partnership. But they're they're the kind of uh, they're the kind of levers. I think we have as a church directly, and I think through our, our agencies, through the Brother of St Lawrence that I'm the chairman of, we, uh, we see this um, pursuing a research base and systemic change as one of the, the core purposes, because we, we think in the modern world, churches on their own uh, uh, are unable to um, make the changes that, that will uh, be as extensive as we need. So I think we, we want to do both of those things together, sort of lead where you can, and then uh, find uh, the points that Brendan's been summarising where change of policy can be advocated for. Can I just say that um, we've made homelessness uh, and, and therefore housing our number one priority at the City of Melbourne. That started to change the conversation. We then convinced the other capital city Lord Mayors to make it their number one issue through the Council of Capital City and Lord Mayors. That has given us an elevated platform to speak to the federal government and then our state governments. The more organisations 
that reflect back on the mandate that they have from their constituents. And I know because it's the number one thing that people write to me about as Lord Mayor. The more organisations reflecting that, uh, that priority for their constituents, that lift this uh, issue up to be the number one priority, and then we coordinate our voices, I think we really will be able to create some more momentum around change. So really encouraging uh, more of that. And that's for us to link in on our efforts as well. So I really take that point. On the domestic violence side, um, that also brings in relationships with the police and other groups who have to deal with this as well. Yeah, we had a session uh, in my office last week with Respect Victoria, which is the organisation set up for the prevention of uh, domestic violence. And we also had the Chief Commissioner there as well as Head of AMBOs and, and a number of other agencies. 60% uh, of the call-outs in the city of Melbourne are for domestic violence issues. 40% across Greater Melbourne are domestic violence issues. And we, this, this is a fundamental, uh, what can I say, issue that faces our community. And we're seeing that in so many different ways play out, uh, causing uh, all sorts of unwanted uh, uh, outcomes. And homelessness is, is one of the most extreme, but so many through that. My, um, I'm going to say this, he'll be, t he'll be disappointed probably that I'm going to, but I had a big debate with my father on Saturday morning. My mother and father, we, we have these great mm. debates, I use them <laughs> as practice. And, uh, but they really present, they're passionate about Melbourne as well. And my father said to me, Sally, why do you feel a need to comment on ring girls at the UFC fight? It's not your issue. You know, and lots of people think, why do we have to change what happens at the UFC fight? Now, he doesn't go to the UFC fights, he doesn't watch boxing, but he's in the, you know, there's too much change going on and why do you need to step into those issues? And I explained to him that the reason I stepped into that issue to say we don't need and we should not have ring girls is because it goes to respect for women and it goes very much to those underlying relationships between men and women and how we uh, objectify women and how we uh, make it too easy uh, for women to be seen uh, as uh, not deserving of respect and therefore deserving of very negative behaviour. I'm giving you a long answer here. But the fact is fundamentally, how does it come back to building that respect between men and women? And how does it come back to that concept of what is fair and what is right, and unfortunately, uh, we are still very much on the extreme of too many men in our community feeling uh, that they can uh, abuse women uh, for reasons that they find completely valid. And so uh, part of the Respect Victoria uh, uh, purpose is, and you would have seen it in many of the advertising uh, uh, campaigns that they've had, is how do we start to uh, get more, more men championing with other men the fact that uh, women need to be treated with respect. If we can do that at a fundamental level, we'll see change. If we can't deal with that fundamental issue, we're in for a really long battle on mm. domestic violence. I want to uh, admire the actions that you are taking and uh, recognising that people move into the cities because they think that's where the panacea of solutions arise, but of course it creates its problems with people wanting to go to greater density. But how do you, as a Lord Mayor and uh, other significant people here, encourage people to decentralise mm. and achieve the same result using the wider areas that we do have available in Australia? How do you do that? It's a very good point. And we do have discussions, I know, at a mayor level uh, with other uh, mayors. Uh, I spend time uh, in our regional cities as well, Geelong and Ballarat and Bendigo particularly at the moment with some projects that we have underway around sharing information and resources and plans. Uh, and just on the homelessness uh, point, uh, I go out with the St Vinnie soup vans on Monday nights when I can, for example. Uh, I pop up when I can to the Salvos, haven't been there for a while, but just on the last Monday night soup van I did, uh, I met somebody who'd come in from Dandenong. I met down in South Bank a gentleman who was sleeping in his car. He'd had to bring his wife to the hospital from Turalgan and they couldn't afford accommodation. So while she was in there, he was in the car and uh, he was having a meal 
at the soup van. So that, that sense of, uh, you know, the, the honeys to, the bees to the pot, I should say, uh, is very uh, pertinent to us when we're looking at homelessness services because we don't, we would love people to be back in the communities from which they came. So we're working on a project at the moment around crisis accommodation and we're doing that with six other municipalities so that uh, the efforts mean that there will be resources shared across those inner Melbourne municipalities. If that project goes well, we're setting it up so that it's replicable across other municipalities. We've already had interest from Frankston, Dandenong and Monash, and we've just said to them, come with us on the journey as we do this, and then if it works well, it's something that we can then help replicate in other uh, neighbourhoods. And so that's one way in which we're definitely sharing uh, the issue and making sure that this just doesn't come uh, be become something that's about the city of Melbourne at all. That's not the intention. You also mentioned the questions around density. Um, so one of the real challenges I think we have is there's a real push to say, well, look, if we can, most people, more, many more people want to live in the city centre or close to the centre, and it's quite logical and rational and reasonable mm. that you would want to do so, because that's where a lot of employment is, that's where services are, that's where our hospitals are. The challenges are, in part, that we're making it really hard for people to be able to do that because we're not allowing more density to take place, whether it be uh, the church taking its existing dwellings and, may, and, and putting high-rises on there, or just across the city itself. You know, you don't have to go far out of the Melbourne CBD before you get to pretty low-density housing comparative to other countries around the world. We've been trying for, you know, 100 years to try to push people to the regions. And, you know, look, I am from regional Victoria. I grew up in Bendigo and Sale and various country towns. I mean, I love those places. Um, the challenge, though, is that as soon as you're beyond, say, 150 kilometres from Melbourne, it's very hard to get um, access to employment. Um, and, you know, we've been trying to do this for a long time, and it hasn't worked. We haven't been able to push people to the regions because they don't... On the whole, people are attracted to where there is, are opportunities, and that is the cities. Um, and so I think a big part of the problem or a big part of the solution has to be to allow more housing to be built where people want to live. And that's one of the reasons that housing is very expensive. I also want to pick up briefly on a point made by the first questioner about two years ago, there was a similar panel here talking mm -hmm. about the same issues. Mm -hmm. Part of the challenge is, I would observe for the last 20 years, Australian governments, either at Commonwealth and state levels, um, who hold most of, the, most of the levers here, so not so much Sally and, and, and the city of Melbourne, they've been promising that we can fix this problem through things that sound good, but in the end don't make much difference. So we saw this during the election campaign. Uh, the, the coalition put forward a policy for a first home deposit um, guarantee scheme, so to help people to, to guarantee their deposit to get them in the housing market. It sounds good. Um, it's proven probably to be quite politically popular, but it doesn't actually have much of an impact on, on housing affordability. It can actually make it worse because you end up bidding up the prices of houses because people have more purchasing power to put into the market. And so over two decades, governments have said, well, look, don't worry, we can solve this problem with these policies that sound good, first home buyers grants, stamp duty concessions, all this sort of stuff. And they've eschewed the kind of things that would actually make a big difference, but be, tend to be more politically controversial, which are negative gearing and capital gains tax reform, allowing more housing in our inner and middle ring suburbs, which obviously is quite controversial for those that live in those areas already. But without those kind of policy changes, then we're still going to find ourselves in the same position in 10, 20 years' time. And it's no surprise that housing affordability is rising up the list of issues that people talk about, and certainly amongst you know, my friends uh, who are tending to be first-home buyers, it's probably the number one thing that they talk about. We can't go a single weekend without that discussion, particularly now the prices are rising again and they're worried that they're going to be priced out for the rest of their lives. Uh, hi, I'm a builder. I've been building for 63 years or something. Um, there's not a housing shortage, there's a housing affordability shortage. What we need to do is change planning. So I see single blocks with one house on, they need to be designed to have two, but not at that time. You build them, say 280 square metres, and then later on, the people want to move from there. They don't move. They divide them in half. They're already designed for that. They're not retrospectively done, and that's the big thing. If they're done at that stage, so then they get an income from this house at the front or the back, or their kids live there or whatever. It's simple, but it will work. I've done it. I've done it illegally. Stuff the government. If they can't do it, you, you break the law. 
That's what they're doing on the street at the moment because no one cares. Sorry. Well, I think the, there is a problem with the planning system that makes it hard to do what you're talking about. Um, and therefore, it means that we do see, when you look across Melbourne or across Sydney and our other major cities, you know, our Australian cities are not very dense compared to global standards, compared to, you know, cities like Vancouver in Canada, uh, let alone the European, the European cities that we often look to as well. And as a result, fewer people can live close to the city and that the, what is, it ends up being quite a scarce resource, which is the housing that's been built close, ends up being really expensive. Um, and places that have allowed a lot more housing to be built have tended to have slower growth in house prices, slower growth in rents, and better affordability overall. The example I often use is actually Japan. So Japan, in the 1980s, the national government took over planning from, uh, the, local, from the lower levels of government, um, and they have a single planning code, and you're essentially allowed to build what you would like, and housing in Japan is relatively abundant and relatively cheap, whereas housing in Australia is not particularly abundant. For, we think of ourselves as a country of wide open plains, but we actually have very little housing per person or per household compared to the global average. And so what you need to do is allow household or, um, landowners to subdivide their plots to allow more housing to be built in those inner and middle ring suburbs. And if you do that, then housing will become cheaper. Yeah, look, I think planning is a very important mechanism, uh, but I can tell you the biggest blocker to planning reform is us. We, uh, I come back to that same point, Brendan, earlier, uh, is that uh, the community attitudes to uh, density really do need to change. And again, let's agree where we want to see density and then let's let it happen. There are uh, provisions under the planning scheme at the moment that allow for density along transport corridors. And on those identified uh, roads and in those places where there's good access to public transport, there's supposed to be an as of right four levels. And four levels seems pretty reasonable in terms of density. Now, I lived in one of those properties, not here in the city of Melbourne. I lived there for 20 years and it was a wonderful family home. And uh, that uh, area had been rezoned. It was on a busy road uh, into a growth area. And so we went ahead and decided we would develop because as of right to four levels on what was a very big block meant that up to about 40 families could actually live there in apartments. Different types of families, three bedrooms through to one bedroom, but 40 families could live in what is an incredibly well-resourced area. There were about 24 objections to our scheme and most of those came from the two blocks of flats on either side of us because they liked having the house in between. And as a result, five townhouses will be built there. I'm crushed and devastated at the result, but there was a planning scheme that allows for four levels, but due to the uh, feedback from community, uh, that local city council decided to, uh, to uh, acquiesce to those views and only allow five townhouses. If we keep going like this, we are going to see more people living on our streets because we are not able to provide the housing supply needed for us to be able to share what is an incredibly prosperous community that we live in. I just think one, one comment on that, from my observation living in Sydney and watching the way big projects like Green Square and others have gone ahead, the fear of the community is not so much the high density, but the lack of provision of services, particularly recreational services, parks for kids, all that sort of thing, that they, don't, they seem to allow the houses to go up, but the infrastructure to just sort of disappear. And I think that that's one of the anxiety generators among Sure, sort of and that's a responsibility, but in most of these growth zones that have been identified, they've been identified for density because they've got good access to public transport, good access to schools, and good access to community facilities. And in Glen Ferry Road, Hawthorne, I can tell you it doesn't get much better in terms of <laughs> parks, uh, you know, public pools, schools, and all the rest of it. And unfortunately, the attitudes there are very much about reducing density, and we just can't keep going that way. Well, the consequence of that will be, you know, I think it's quite rational that people do what you're, what you're saying, Sally. You know, that's, if you live in an area that is well-serviced by public transport, by parks, by schools, by libraries, 
why would you want more people to come into that community when you can have it the way you do? The issue is one of politics, that the, the local residents have a say about what gets built, and those that would move into the area, if, say, that development had gone ahead, don't get a vote, they don't get a say. And the, the consequence of that will be, you know, we have to be aware of what the trade-off is here. If we continue down the path that we are, mm -hmm. where we say no to more density in our major cities, then the consequence will be that our children will not be able to live close to us because they will not be able to afford a house. It'll be very hard to find someone to downsize to because the exact kind of housing that um, old Australians would like to downsize to won't have been built. And we will have these problems that we see you know, on our streets where a growing number of Australians will find themselves homeless because they're simply priced out of housing, out of shelter, which is a, a fundamental right that all Australians should have access to. Yeah, so the, the last discussion really is something that I think has come up as a theme in a couple of our different topics, which is the, the curious Australian mix of the, an intervention between markets as giving you an, an honest um, story of what value is, and then intervention, which distorts markets. And I think that um, Australia generally has some profound issues about uh, in a, in not really trusting markets to, uh, uh, to set value, and uh, we, we have a, a very highly interventionist desire, which I think in the end distorts markets. So I think you know, you've almost got to be in one place or another. We're in this kind of funny hybrid model, whether it's in energy markets or whether it's in uh, housing markets or other things, that, that there, there isn't really the, um, the honesty of, of, of value that can kind of um, express itself. So we have a, a very much a mixed mode, and I don't know if that always serves us well. But anyway, let's uh, bring this in as we pray uh, across all these things we've spoken about. Lord God, we uh, know that housing is something that's of uh, great significance to us all, and we pray that Australians might have opportunities of uh, security of, of housing and shelter. Uh, we pray that as we've heard those things, that we might be a bit challenged ourselves from um, uh, where our selfishness or our uh, limited perspective uh, closes uh, our eyes or our empathy from the changes that will make a difference for others. And so we thank you for those who are active in this area, for their passion, for their analysis, and uh, for all of us as we take these ideas back into our community as we represent them to those who we speak to. So we uh, commit all of this to you in Jesus' name. Amen.